Welcome. Recording in progress. Uh, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, inaugural session of the uh, Cisco Research Seminar on AIDS, uh, Global Health and Human Rights. That's the title uh, we originally chose. I'll say a couple of words uh, on the seminar and the project uh, behind it uh, before giving the floor to our uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, Professor, Professor uh, Jennifer uh, Breer. Uh, the project uh, originates uh, from an idea of my colleagues, uh, Ilaria Pavan uh, and Marco Rovinello, whom uh, I, I, along with me uh, ran this seminar and whom I want to, uh, to thank. Uh, and the idea was to put together a, a group of historians with uh, different uh, research interests, uh, area studies expertise, even historiographical sensibilities, interested in working together on the history of AIDS, uh, HIV. And they kindly, Larry and Marco reached out to me after learning that uh, it was one of the uh, too many research projects that I had begun uh, working on. Uh, we organized a first panel at the Cantieri uh, the Cisco Biannual Conference, uh, Maria Elena Cantilena, Francesco Torchiani, and Emmanuel Betta also uh, contributed uh, to the panel, where we basically fleshed out, in a few cases, not even a work in progress, but a sort of wanna do uh, a wish list. And we proposed uh, this seminar to the Cisco uh, government, uh, which responded very positively and accepted uh, to a sponsor. At least in these uh, first sessions, the first three sessions, uh, from today uh, to, uh, to May, we'd like to use the seminar to engage primarily in a sort of historiographical and methodological uh, reflection uh, and conversation. That's why we asked our guest speakers uh, to try to address in their presentations some general research themes and issues concerning the state of the art, the sources, uh, the, the inter and multidisciplinary uh, dialogue, and also the role of uh, AIDS militancy and grassroots activism, somehow actors and subjects, historians and archives at the same time of the story we'd, we'd like to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to work on. Now for this first session, we're very lucky to have with us uh, Jennifer Breer. She's professor of history and women's studies at the University of Illinois at uh, Chicago. She's the author of a, of a gem of a book uh, right here, uh, Infectious Ideas, a US Political Response to the AIDS Crisis, which was published a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, in 2009. Uh, and uh, it's a book that uh, I believe uh, uh, succeeds in uh, linking, using AIDS to, to, to link the social and political history of the 1980s and 90s, and also in some parts with, as a historian of the Cold War, as an international historian, I found truly enlightening. So uh, in linking, connecting the domestic AIDS policy, the US domestic AIDS policy and activism to the global AIDS policy and activism, uh, Professor Breer also guest edited uh, 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 an important uh, roundtable on the Journal of American History in 2017. I think it was the very first time the OAH uh, journal dealt with the history of uh, HIV uh, AIDS. She co-edited with Jim Downs and Jennifer Morgan Connections, Histories of Race and Sex in North America, but she has also been very active, if I may say so, as a public historian, uh, in organizing various uh, exhibitions, uh, 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 one of them out in Chicago, titled Out in Chicago, Exhibiting LGBT History at the Crossroads. Another one was titled Surviving and Thriving AIDS Politics and Culture, which was a traveling exhibition for the National Library of Medicine. And she's currently, and that's the topic she is, discusses in a very fascinating article we have pre-circulated uh, she's currently leading a, a team of the University of Illinois Chicago faculty, students and staff to uh, in a community curated mobile gallery called History Moves. And she has explained in the article what History Moves is about and what kind of history History Moves aims uh, at producing. So without further ado, uh, uh, the floor is your Jennifer and on behalf of the entire team behind this seminar. I want to thank you for accepting the invitation and for being with us uh, tonight. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mario. I'm gonna just do one thing on my computer because my eyes are old. Um, I am honored to be here with you tonight uh, for me this morning um, from Chile, Chicago. 
um, I only wish I could be with you in Paris or in Rome. <laughs> would be much nicer than where I am right now. I want to thank Mario for inviting me to this seminar and I'm honored to be among such um, such incredible interlocutors. It's uh, I think the history of HIV AIDS in many ways for me has um, re has been reinvigorated in the last several years, but it was a little lonely for a while, I have to say. Um, and I'm also just, I, my heart is full um, to see my dear friend Nando Fashi here. Um, we didn't know until last week that that was our connection through this because he wrote me and said, I'm coming to the seminar. I didn't of course put together that of course Nando would be involved in, in such a thing called the European History Seminar. Um, and the once and only time I was in Italy, it was with Nando um, in Genoa and um, Siena and it was before I knew I would be a historian, but he was already an amazing scholar writing about popular culture, labor and capitalism. And so I am just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Um, so I've prepared some notes on the questions that Mario sent me and done some reorganization to save time and try and keep honest on this hour, this exciting potential of an hour long conversation among us. Um, so I've grouped them together into two pairs and hopefully that'll move me from a quick review of the literature into um, a slightly deeper dive uh, into the women's history of HIV project that you read about but now you can see in a new way given where we're at in the project. So the first question Mario, the first sets of questions Mario asked me was about the state of the field and its sort of inter and multidisciplinarity. So as has always been the case with the history and historiography of HIV AIDS, academic historians are far from the only and actually really far from perhaps the best or even the first people writing and producing histories of HIV AIDS. Um, and we could talk a lot about the language, whether we're talking about AIDS history, AIDS studies, HIV AIDS, that might be an interesting conversation. It's also very much in my mind as we start to think about what we're going to call COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, long haul COVID, all of these things, sort of thinking about the way we name disease in particular as historians, I think is an important conversation, but one that might be better taken up in questions. Um, and it's really hard for me at some level to get my head around the fact that I wrote one of the first historical monographs about AIDS as a historian that was published 12 plus years ago. So I think it's a sort of interesting moment to be reflecting on that and seeing from this perspective that I never thought I would be in the growth of a field um, and really being able to work with scholars from across the United States and some in Canada who are working on this uh, history and what it feels like to sort of talk to them about infectious ideas, um, which seems like it was written yesterday, but was really written so long ago that it's almost time for it to be rewritten. And, and, and people who are doing this work really are rewriting it right now, and that's exciting. So I wanna tell you about some work that I've been doing in the last couple of years um, that has really brought me in to new ways of thinking about the history of HIV, and that is through uh, collective organizing. So for the last two years, I've been thinking and writing with an entity a collective called What Would an HIV Doula Do? Um, the collective has been in existence since 2016, and they have produced, they're a group of artists and activists and healthcare providers and harm reductionists who have produced various cultural artifacts related to HIV AIDS. They ask questions of each other and they make space as doulas do in moments of extended moments of transition. And the work that I, the first project that I did with them was, I'm gonna share my screen, was a project called um, 27 Questions for Writers and Journalists to Consider When Writing About COVID-19 and HIV AIDS. And I can post all of these to the chat after so that you can look at them again. But 
Um, what this project really did was allow us to work together to think through a sort of interdisciplinary but deeply historical approach to understanding um, and really helping people understand that it's, especially in the beginning of, um, in 2020, when we first drafted these questions, um, the sort of very too quick, too uncomplicated comparison between HIV AIDS and COVID-19. And the, the questions that we generated, the process that we embarked on was really an important one for me as an academic historian, trying to work hard to create public history that put various publics at the center of the work. And so I think the questions are worth um, looking at for your seminar in part because they follow much of the same um, questions as Mario posed to me. One's about your framework, one's about your sources, your subjects, your audiences, your impact. So it really, they really are questions I think that, that historians can um, look to and see themselves, but also sort of imagine some ways that a range of different AIDS workers have been taking up these questions. The second project that I did with, um, with the uh, What Would an HIV Doula Collective Do is a project that we released in the summer of 2021 called AIDS Is, AIDS Ain't 40. So I'm sure that, um, that you were in the mix if you're thinking about the history of, of AIDS about what was what was happening in um, June of 2021 was the 40th anniversary of the first reported, the first published reported cases of this thing that would become AIDS. So whether it's the um, MMWR, uh, pneumocystis pneumonia Los Angeles that's linked here, um, or rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals in the New York Times, um, we really wanted to produce something that not only questioned what it meant to mark that as the start of AIDS, so that we were at 40 when we got to the summer of 2021, but also to recognize that um, there was both a longer history of AIDS that pre-existed all of this, whether you look at the sort of natural history work that's been done that looks at the origins of the jump between uh, simian to human, or whether you think about the experience of Robert Rayford, the um, black teenager in St. Louis, who is one of the first, among the first documented cases of a person dying from HIV in 1969 in St. Louis who's been written about by my colleague in the doulas, Ted Kerr, um, or whether you think about some of the women in the project that I'll share with you, who um, are among, I believe, the longest surviving people with HIV, including a woman who grew up down the block from where I am at the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, gave birth to a child in March of 1981, um, who was positive and they are both still alive to this day, suggesting that she was certainly positive sometime in the late 70s, if not um, just at the end, just at the turn of that decade. Um, and then also all of the reality that there are a range of people who are living with HIV in their bodies right now for whom AIDS isn't 40, whether you say it is for yourself or not. It's it's four days old, it's right, it's not over. It's still part of our current um, reality. And so this project was really important and it we picked up on and wanted to pay homage to Marlon Riggs, the um, black gay filmmaker in the United States who um, made a range of really important films that were about AIDS, died from um, complications related to AIDS including his, his um, 1994 posthumously released film, Black Is Black Ain't, which if you haven't watched ever, um, you must watch. It is an incredible film. It, it shows him dying 
Um, it's an incredibly powerful film. So we really wanted to make an homage to Marlon Riggs and recognize how important he was in understanding the history of, of AIDS. The other thing that this produced and which you'll be able to see is a really incredible resource list of books and articles about um, HIV that I think is quite incredible in terms of sort of understanding the, the, the interdisciplinary um, scholarship and um, artistic practice on AIDS. So you can access all of that there. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, so all of that is there. Um, and academic historians, many of whom are connected to what would an HIV doula do, especially a group of graduate students who are studying at Yale right now, have been producing a vibrant historiographical field. Um, I know more about the case of the United States than I do about outside, but I would say that what I find most exciting about that work is that it has really, over the last 15 or so years, really done the work of making real what I think Paul Farmer sets out in AIDS and Accusation and in Infections and Inequalities, that there is a deep connection between HIV AIDS, structural violence, white supremacy, um, or anti-Blackness and movements for social change that are led at least in part by people of color. And I would say that the work that's emerged in, in the United States and in Canada in the last decade has really been deeply, the work I'm most excited about has been deeply um, connected to that. So the Journal of American History Interchange that Mario talked about, which was um, me talking with a group of scholars um, who are really producing some incredible work um, that I, I strongly recommend you look at for the bibliography alone. Um, there was a Souls um, edition published in the journal Souls, published in 2019 called The Black AIDS Epidemic, co-edited by my new colleague Darius Bost, who just joined the faculty at UIC. Um, and uh, Marlon Bailey, who is on the faculty at Arizona State, who is an ethnographer of AIDS. Darius's book, Evidence of Being, um, is recently out. It's a book about Black gay men, about poets and artists, and how they respond to AIDS along the eastern seaboard, not just in New York, but in Philadelphia and um, DC. It's really quite a beautiful book and um, one that I've taught with, to great success. And then Dan Royals' new book, To Make the Wounded Whole, a book about Black African-American um, AIDS activism is another book that I think is part of this um, collection. And then there's a new edited collection out by Duke um, in 2020 called AIDS and the Distribution of Crises, um, co-edited by a group of people with essays that are from across the US and Canada. Um, there's a great essay about um, uh, Haitian Canadians and sort of rethinking the timeline of HIV in Montreal. It's a really beautiful book and it argues, of course, all of these argue in essence that the AIDS crisis is not over and also that there is no singular AIDS crisis. So it is both the AIDS crisis is not over and it's the distribution of crises. And I think those are some of the big um, you know, those titles really do a lot of work. The Radical History Review um, published its first issue on AIDS, just to say like, um, history has not, as a field, has not embraced the study of AIDS. <laughs> I think I can safely say that. Um, uh, across uh, historiographical traditions. <laughs> Perhaps the historians of medicine would debate that, but. I don't even know so much that they would debate that because they really haven't done as much. But the RHR had never published an issue on AIDS. So they did that in 2021. The AIDS crisis is not over. It's a beautiful collection and several of the essays in it just won big prizes from the Committee on LGBT History, which is part of the AHA. So that's some of, for me, that's, what's, that's what I'm really excited about right now. Is, is seeing that work that takes seriously what it means to talk about um, AIDS, HIV AIDS as um, very much about 
anti-blackness, very much about the, the sort of making real what it means to talk about the racial disparities in the United States. Um, what it means to push back fundamentally against the idea that AIDS was ever a white gay male disease. It never was. Um, and this is work that I think is really doing that. The other work, so two other books are just out. Sarah Shulman's book, Let the Record Show, the, the 800 page tomb, which when I'm talking from home, I'm, I'm about my office today, I use to prop up my computer because it's the perfect height for me, but this computer has a better angle. Um, so that book, which is the collection of um, the sort of uh, synthetic collection of the interviews that she did um, with Jim Hubbard for a decade. And then just out this week, Stephen Thrasher's book, The Viral Underclass. Um, Stephen is my colleague at Northwestern in the Medill School of Journalism, um, wrote for The Guardian for a long time. And his book is just out about, uh, about how um, viruses, poverty, class really create um, systems of inequality. And, and I, we could talk at I mean, I would happily talk at length about Let the Record Show, um, but I'll say this, in my most recent, I have, I'm in a long-standing conversation with Sarah Shulman about women and HIV. And um, we went for a walk and we had this conversation about the book and about my work. And I guess what I see as I even just list all of those texts, is that nothing there is expressly about women or even mostly about women. So I'm trained as a women's historian and I wrote infectious ideas as a dissertation under um, my dissertation advisor, Alice Kessler Harris, you know, the, among the most preeminent women's labor historians um, of our era, maybe of time. And, um, I, I didn't understand, I mean, I understood that I wasn't writing a women's history. I was writing as someone trained in women's history, but it wasn't until I started this project, um, The Living Women's History of HIV, that I understood how estranged I was from women's history by being a person writing the history of AIDS. Now, that is not to say that that was correct. <laughs> it was a huge problem for me, but I see it replicated again and again and again. None of those texts are about women and even fewer of them are about women living with HIV in their bodies. They may write about women as caregivers or as part of a story or feminist activists as among AIDS activists, but there is not a single woman living with HIV whose oral history Sarah Shulman has reported. So I'll say that one more time. That, that book, Let the Record Show and the ACT UP Oral History Project is a project that is designed to interview whoever consents, any living member of ACT UP who wants their story recorded, right? So they've done, I think 200 of them, maybe more than that. There is not a single woman living with HIV whose story is recorded. So for me, that has really been the animating force of looking outside of history for that material. And I would say that much of that work has been done by sociologists. Um, and there are three texts that I'll name here, but that's just a few of them. Most recently, Celeste Watkins Hayes remaking a life how women living with HIV confront inequality. Celeste was my colleague at Northwestern. She has gone to the University of Michigan. That book I think was out in 2019. Michelle Tracy Berger's 2004 book, Workable Sisterhood about, um, uh, and Celeste's book is about women in Chicago. Some of the women that we've interviewed the same women. Um, Workable Sisterhood is about Detroit, black women in Detroit. And Allison O'Daniel's book, Holding On from 2016 is about North Carolina. Um, and I think it would be interesting, I don't know who's here and what fields people um, sort of resonate with, but I think, 
I've been talking a lot about this with students as of late, as I've taught all of these, all of these texts in the last five years, a couple times, um, what the difference is between the sociology of women living with HIV and the history of women living with HIV. And we, I think there's an interesting methodological question. I think there's an interesting ethical question. I think there's an interesting um, question about what the arguments are that animate that work. Um, I think this question of generalizability and replication is very different than accounting for um, how people's lived experience hold significance in those moments, even if they're not connected to other people. We could talk, I mean, that to me is a very interesting question to talk about with a group of scholars who come at things in very different ways. Um, and so I'll use that to transition into the second part of what I wanna tell you about today, which is um, for the last seven years, um, and in collaboration with a graphic designer named Matt Wazinski, who teaches design at the University of Cincinnati, and a large and ever-changing group of students, undergraduates and graduate students at Cincinnati and UIC in history, museum studies, public health, graphic design, and computer science. So me and Matt, all of our students, and then three of the sites of the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is um, called The Wise, which is the longest running longitudinal study of the natural history of HIV in women and people assigned female at birth that's funded by the NIH. It's now been joined with the men's study, the MAX. So they're together now. They were not together for the first 24 years or so. And that really brings me into the second prompts that Mario asked me to talk about, which are about sources and AIDS militancy or grassroots activism. And um, I will say that for me, building this living women's history of HIV with this group of 40 women living with HIV in three different cities, Chicago, Brooklyn, and Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, has really allowed me to address, to think through the questions that Mario asked about sources and AIDS militancy and all of the paradoxes raised inside of them. So, I would say that I had to build through this collaboration, in this collaboration, a new archive, because yes, we are inundated with sources. And it is still, as a, as a historian, interested in looking sideways through things, um, or as a women's historian, trying to read between the lines or trying to find traces of things. Um, I often feel like um, I'm not just looking for a needle in a haystack, like I'm looking for things in a haystack that's never been bunched into a pile. So it is a really complicated story. And we could talk about this, you know, I've, I've said it in other contexts. I spent a lot of time at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. There are I, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper that have some version of HIV AIDS on them. And to figure out how to collect them all together, Mario asked about declassification procedures, um, how that works. And then just what happens that that's the last set of records that are pretty much on paper. Then we go into almost all digital files and the question about how you search in that material um, is quite difficult, but then there's also the reality, and we could talk about this, um, that women appear in the archive at certain periods of time for a range of reasons and they are completely absent from other parts of the conversation. So even if you're looking for HIV, you're not gonna find something related to women because they're not gonna be appearing next to those letters, right? If you're doing the search. So I feel like I had to create um, this new archive and it was one that I was committed to creating that centered the experiences of people living with HIV inside their bodies. Um, and for me, it, it came in the form of this public history project, which I will share with you now. And then I will show you a few things and then we'll open it up. 
Um, so this is the I'm still surviving. Oh, wait, hold on. I want to do one other thing. I just need to share it with sound because we're going to listen to something. Okay, so this is the um, the Living Women's History Project, I'm Still Surviving. Um, and you can see that it covers these three places. The students, um, our students built this in that first COVID summer. We had seven students volunteer to work on the project and they built the wireframes and they made the project. Um, really incredible project. So I want to show you the three different parts of it in not in this not in the right order. So the first one is see the women's histories of um, HIV, and we produced a set of narratives. Um, how can we center women in the history of HIV? Does family matter? You can look at all of them. I want to show you this first one. How can we center women in the history of HIV/AIDS? And we used different techniques to sort of um, make the words come to life in this section. We animated the words here, much like a poem. Um, it took a long time to recognize women because what works for us is not working for men, but I'll be here for you, baby. These were all done in conversation as you read about in the piece, if you saw it, and then you'll see other things come into focus. And then we sort of used the, the um, archive that we had of historical images and we countered that with each of the quotes that the, with quotes that the women selected about the topic. So you can read through all of them. Each, um, each narrative I think has four or five sub themes and then there are about seven or eight um, oral history excerpts in each one. And you can see where each woman is from and read each one in turn. And we really, I really tried to have a light hand in the um, curatorial space here to allow the process that the women produced in collaboration with one another to be the part of it that, that sings. So there's not um, a lot of my writing here, even as there is a lot of organizational work that's behind what is here. And you can, um, you can take a look at it at your leisure. Um, we've got images from um, various historical societies and some from the National Library of Medicine from the project that I did for them. Then um, we have just been able to finish um, making books for the women and they are now and the rest will be available um, by the end of February and I can send that to you as well on a print on demand service called blurb where you'll be able to order the book and have a printed copy of it arrive um, in your house. <laughs> um, we'll also have an ebook that will be free for people but this will produce a, a proper trade quality book. Um, and it collects all of the um, all of the stories from each place together, Brooklyn, Chicago, and North Carolina. And you'll be able to see them all, including the personal photographs that the women shared with us. I wanna um, take you to one final place before I stop talking, which is the Hear the Women's Voices section. Um, we worked with a, a grad student who was sort of at the intersection of computer science and graphic design to design this very, very simple interface that lets you access the sound of the women's, like the excerpts of the women's oral history. So we work with their, their we work with photographs, we work with oral histories as audio and oral histories as transcripts. Those are the things, those are the building blocks of our work. And then we put them together in different configurations um, to allow people to access them in the ways that they need to access them or best can access them. So I wanna play some of this for you. I thought it was a death sentence too when I first found out about it and it and, and, and ended up making me a better person. I ended up becoming stronger and being more health conscious uh, and, and, and without drug use and, and being more mindful and more aware of my body and the things that I need to do for me to stay healthy. Because one of the things that I feared most 
in in the why study was I remember one of the questions they asked me was um, what is the one thing you fear most and I remember breaking out crying in the middle of a study when they asked you asked me asked me a question I was like watching my kids grow up and it always stuck in my head and now my kids are grown and uh, I have two grandbabies. When they gave it to me, I could be at the dope house. Call my friend, yo, but I forgot to take my medicine. Can you bring it to me? You know, that's how serious I was. Well, this is not going to beat me. I'm going to beat it. And it's been, I mean, and now, as I look back over my life, I wouldn't change a thing. Nothing would I have changed. Because... What I got now is way, way better than what I had then. My children love me. My family still loves me. But most of all, I love me. And if I can love me, who cares what people think or what people say? I'm not angry with this disease. Matter of fact, this disease saved my life. So you can keep listening. Um, you can you can sort of hear the conversations across women. We wanted it to be like a conversation, which is what they were. Um, and I guess I'll end by saying that um, so. I guess this leaves us at a place where, and maybe it is the perfect sort of transition into the conversation, thinking about sources, um, sources for what and by whom, made by whom, like who makes them. Um, not one of the women featured on this website ever uttered the name ACT UP in the hours and hours and hours of testimony that they shared or the term AIDS militancy or grassroots struggle or anything. Um, yet they talked about the kind of grassroots work that rarely gets captured in any archive, particularly when it's done by and for women. And that really brought me back to where I was trained, which is that when you put women at the center of history, it changes the way you tell everything. Um, it changes the way you, you think about the archive, it changes the way you think about periodization, it changes the way you think about significance and what matters and what the moments are that you look to. Um, and that for me has really, it's, it's a sort of full circle moment for me to think about what it means to have written this book in, in the 2000s, which I sort of have said at different times, like, I mean, protease inhibitors existed for the entire time that I was writing that book, but I really wrote that book as if that did not exist. Maybe you can tell, like, I don't think I understood that until pretty recently that I had written that book. Like I had frozen myself in a period of time to write that book. Um, and um, I, and now I see the possibilities of doing something else. Like what does it mean to produce a living women's history of HIV, both because it centers people who are living, it centers women, and it does a kind of work that I don't feel like anyone is really successfully doing. So I'm gonna end with, um, with the words, oh shit, did I not download it right? All right, hold on a second. I'm gonna do this. Hopefully this will work. Um, I downloaded, I, I, I emailed myself of course, and it didn't come through the way I wanted it to. Hold on one second. I'm gonna try to play this and if it doesn't work while you're asking me questions, I'll um, get it from some other way. Um, this is Deborah who um, is from Chicago, um, just a person who I have um, found such incredible uh, love and respect for, 
talking about her experience at Cook County Hospital, and I'm pointing down the block from me because Cook County Hospital is down the block from UIC. I'll never forget, I walked up one day and there was this guy who just had the sheet wrapped around him and he was just rocking. He was like, I've been here for five days. Nobody's talked to me. You know, they barely want to touch me. And I'm like, you know, come from up under this sheet. Um, we can talk. I'm here. I ain't going nowhere. You know, and for me, that was, that was my epiphany. Exactly. You know, to see him just wrapped up, just waiting to die, because, well, the nurses only came when they had to, you know. So from that point on, I started running my mouth and talking. I started running my mouth and talking from that point on. So I'll end with that and I can play more for you if you like, but thank well, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, there are you know, uh, uh, a lot of things to discuss here, uh, of course. Uh, I forgot uh, saying uh, in my brief introduction that uh, yours is the first of a three part uh, uh, seminar. Uh, there will be other two uh, uh, following on April 5. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Thibaut Boulevard, you can see his shadow moving around in one of the Zoom boxes. He's just nearby, he's just next to my office. Uh, uh, we'll be speaking about uh, art and AIDS. And then on Monday, May 9, uh, Alan Whiteside uh, of the University of Waterloo uh, will uh, discuss the AIDS epidemic the first 15 years, uh, 1981 to 1996. And uh, that's it. Uh, um, and the, the floor is open uh, for questions and comments. You can either raise your virtual end, uh, hand if you want to intervene, or you can use, uh, you can signal that to us uh, via the chat function of Zoom. So uh, if there are questions and comments, uh, I have a few, but I don't want to abuse my position uh, as, as chair. So I prefer others to uh, intervene. I see that Jennifer has uh, shared uh, a link uh, uh, on the chat. So if no one else, that's the typical shyness of the Italian historians, uh, 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 Jenny. Uh, uh, <laughs> let me just say a couple. Uh, ask a couple of uh, of, 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 ge uh, of general questions, and then and then we can move on. So, on the one side, I mean, the story you tell is immensely fascinating because you know, ACT UP and all that kind of activism was allegedly you know challenging the official narrative or offering an alternative narrative uh, of the history of HIV AIDS. And now you are telling us that a narrative must be challenged. And somehow my impression is that it's linked also to how AIDS was represented, uh, as you said, mainly as a white man, gay disease. Is it that because white men and white gays had political and media agency in the 80s and 90s. And that political and media agency somehow explains why that kind of narrative and representation became so hegemonic, so, so dominant. That's my first question. The second question is a bit, I mean, I, I hope it sounds, it sounds it right, because I, it, it doesn't want to be polemical, but the story you are telling us, it's a very US American story. It is somehow a very exceptionalist story in the sense that race, of course, doesn't figure so prominently in connection to AIDS in many other national cases. So how do you link, not, well, you know, uh, how do you link <laughs> kind of American story. Yeah. The broader story and what does that approach, the approach you just, you know, you just presented, what kind is, you know, this, let's say, methodological innovations or changes, this history from below, these voices, this ability to give voice to people who are, ha, have long been silenced 
how can that be translated to yeah. other you know national settings other realities so yeah. then finally sorry i have a very small question i i, okay. I, I was a bit, a bit puzzled That's... by you by your by your comparisons you have brooklyn you have chicago yeah. you have a small Hi. city a small city yeah. of carolina so i'm just wondering why durham yeah. was included in the comparison so I'll do the last one first, um, because the project is not about creating a complete history. It's about, it started as a collaboration and those were the sites that wanted to be part of the collaboration. Those were the sites that thought that, the, that they had the capacity to engage the women to be part of it. So Chicago and Brooklyn make sense. Obviously Chicago's down the street from me. I'm from Brooklyn, so that makes sense. The North Carolina part makes no sense, except that, and this perhaps gets to your exceptionalist, your exceptionalism question, which is the worst thing about US historians, um, is that uh, US based US historians, um, is that uh, the way the national AIDS epidemic looks in the United States it is a profoundly in the 21st century, a profoundly Southern epidemic. There is no way to understand HIV at this moment in time without understanding what's happening in the US South. It has the, um, it has the overwhelming, the greatest number of new cases. It has the highest prevalence. It has not expanded. Medicaid state by state, that's the way things happen in the states, you know, because we don't have health insurance. Um, it has, it's the blackest epidemic. It's, I mean, it, it's where AIDS is. So in that respect, North Carolina makes a ton of sense, um, in part because uh, Raleigh Durham has a Durham is called the city of medicine. It's got a long history as a site of healthcare, right? That triangle between Duke and North Carolina, UNC and NC State and all of that. Um, and it's also a place where the realities of infectious disease are such that um, HIV is, is truly a crisis. Um, so all of that to say, um, I guess I would I would beg to differ that race doesn't matter outside of the U.S. context. Yeah. So, but even so, um, that doesn't undercut the reality that this is an account of wi a women's history of HIV in the United States. Um, I think the method of history moves is useful. I will sing the praises of it. Like, I think it's actually a really important method. It is far from a groundbreaking. <laughs> it is far, like, I mean, to be talking to Italians about oral history is sort of whatever. I, I'm very aware of what I'm doing, but it is to say, like, this project is based very much in the idea that people um, can be not just storytellers of their own lives, but historians of their own lives and understands the difference between the two of them. Meaning we, we have a, a practice of hearing individuals tell stories and then historians take those stories and interpret them and make them into histories. And I actually think that part of what History Moves has done with these women um, in the United States is to ask them to do that interpretive building. Um, so I think that tool is useful outside of the US context because it's one that says that through collaboration and centering the people most impacted, you are able to understand something that you can't understand from outside of it. Uh, but I do think that, um, you know, just as a note, like the US exceptionalism that's stitched into this project is also a function of the fact that I've been trying to build some relationships in Miami to write that women's history of HIV, which is a totally different history, women's history of HIV than the one even in Brooklyn. 
um, because it's really a story about Haitian migration and um, immigrant uh, working conditions and the experiences of women um, in those communities. So it's a much more transnational story. The same is true of the Canadian case in Montreal with Haitian migrants to Canada. Um, but um, I think that it's really um, the way the women's history of HIV perhaps has been written is more outside of the United States than it is inside of the United States. So when you think about the historiography, let's say about parts of the African continent, particularly the Southern part of the continent, you might hear more about women. I would still argue that, that those are less historical than they are sociological. Um, and I, but I don't think that there is enough um, connective tissue between those things. Um, but I do know that, I mean, and you all know this too, you know, AIDS is, is just a lens through which to see these things. So you can, you can use HIV AIDS to write any number of national histories. You could also use HIV to write any number of transnational histories. Um, you could also use HIV AIDS um, as a way, you know, to see the relationship between domestic and international politics. Um, but, um, and then this will get me to what I think is your, I think I'll, I think I'll stop and move to the first question, which is why um, the, the exceptional part about the, the, the substance of the exception for the US exception is white gay men. That is actually the, that's the, that's the heart of the exception. So I would say that that, and it's, and it's completely inaccurate as most exceptional histories are. <laughs> um, and it, um, and I guess the one other thing that I would say is that uh, the women who are part of this project, some of whom have only moved inside of the United States and some of whom have moved um, have moved into the United States. We did interview a group of, of Spanish speaking women in North Carolina. I couldn't get any of the women, um, the Haitian immigrants in Brooklyn to talk to me. I'm not quite sure why, but they didn't want to. And I wasn't going to make them. That's not the point of this. Um, but so there are transnational stories in there. That's one other thing to say. Um, but the the exceptionalism of of, gay, of white gay men is in part about power. So we you know we've heard we've heard from various places like this was a moment when for the first time um, many white gay men actually experienced a particular kind of state-based homophobia, although I would argue that if you look at the longer history of, of queer activism, you, especially in a place like Chicago, you see constant police surveillance and harassment. But I think the other thing that happens, and I've been thinking a lot about this, I just taught last semester my class AIDS politics and culture, and I can share the syllabus with you. Um, but how much those first um, pieces that I that are uh, quoted in the in AIDS is AIDS ain't forty. Like as soon as they started talking about homosexuality or gayness at the time, it was homosexuality. As soon as that happened, it erased everything else from the picture. So if you look at the public health literature from the 70s, you see um, in the mid to late 70s, there are about maybe half a dozen or a dozen articles about community acquired pneumocystis pneumonia among heroin users. That's AIDS, but it's never part of the story because as soon as it's marked as the start at that moment, you miss everything else. And so I would say it's both about the subjects taking up a kind of space. And it's about, in this case, um, 
the medical sector or the, you know, the um, healthcare providers or scientists blinding themselves to things because they're looking for things that are unusual, right? And this heroin addicts dying of pneumonia is like hardly unusual. <laughs> it's like they're sick because they're, they're sick. They're heroin drug user, like those things are all together. Um, and of course, women are part of that story. There's another story about um, what it means to sell blood products in the in the early 1980s that are part of that's part of this story, and that's an international story, of course. Also, um, there's um, so I think there are a lot of things that make that amnesia, and then when you sort of come back to act up there is a split in ACT UP about, right? Like I need to save my life right now and healthcare and housing are a human right that are health, that are healthcare, right? So there's that split too. Um, and then when you can hear a group of women say that HIV saved their lives, you have to think about what that means, right? It's not just that they got clean, but it's also, it was the first time that they were ever seen as people deserving of care. So just like, it really changes the way you think about that, those questions. I hope I've answered that. No, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It's interesting, you know, uh, during the, the, the Cisco panel uh, I was referring to uh, at the beginning, uh, I you know I was I'm more familiar with the uh, the U.S. literature with the U.S. case, whereas my my colleague Marco, Ilaria, Mariella, they were you know discussing the Italian case where I'm simplifying, but just for the sake of uh, of explaining it, uh, where the HIV epidemic, especially at first, it was mostly you know related to heroin consumption, intravenous drug uh, users, even because you know homosexuality. Yeah. It was still a kind of a taboo in, in early 1980s Italy. And so that's that how it was, you know, marked and narrated, which is quite interesting because then public policies follow that kind of, you know, media and political uh, uh, representation with all uh, that uh, ensues. Um, so who wants to... Well, I would love to hear some about that because I actually think that um, the the history of a, of HIV and relationship to heroin, and then in the states the history of HIV and relationship to crack. So the history of HIV and relationship to drug use is probably one of the most transnational ways to talk about it. Mm. Yep. Questions, comments, Ilaria. And if you can just, you know, briefly introduce uh, uh, yourself, the people who, who intervene. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Ilaria Pavan, I'm one of the organizer with Marco and Mario of this uh, seminar. And we are beginning to, to work on IDS in Italy, <laughs> initially at least. Okay. As, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you, Jennifer, uh, for your a fascinating presentation. And my questions are uh, related to your methodological approach. Uh, I mean, your approach based on oral history on, and which focuses on the self-determination and subjectivity of uh, uh, women uh, living with HIV. Um, what does it tell us that is new? about the history IDS um, in, in the US, but maybe in general, according to your opinion, of course. And does it shed light, uh, um, does it shed new light on, on what aspect of the history of IDS? And final question, uh, are there connections with earlier and different published projects even by people living with uh, AIDS or, or not? These are my questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laria. Penny? Those are great questions. Thank you. Um, I would say I'll, I'll, I'll kind of combine the questions together to answer them. Um, one of the things that we do methodologically it, is we, 
and you read about it in the piece from Oral History Review, we transcribe the interviews and then not surprisingly, we return those transcriptions to the narrators to edit them. But more than that, we ask them to mark the interview transcript with things that they don't want shared publicly and things that they must share publicly. And I think that that intervention was really important because so many of, so these women are very used to being studied. They've been in a study, a, a long longitudinal study for 20 plus years. They're used to answering questions. They, you know, I would hear them talk about the, I've never seen, they, I've never seen the, uh, the instrument that Wise uses the long questions, but I could, but they would tell me off tape, um, yeah, you know, I was in today and I just knew that if I answered that question, yes, I was gonna have to answer all these other questions. So I just said no, because I just didn't wanna answer all of the questions that come with that yes. Like, so they know they are used to being studied. And one of the things that they, that more than a few of them said was like, this was the first time we got to control what the study looked like. We got to control what went out into the world. So in that respect, I'll, I'll say a couple things. One is that gives, that, that gives them a kind of interpretive power that they do not have otherwise. Uh, and that in essence connects them to earlier memoir and other kinds of first person accounts of HIV. I'm thinking of things, you know, like Paul Monette, people writing about their experience living with or dying from HIV, uh, Marlon Riggs, um, Amy Hoffman's hospital time, like go on and on. Um, and um, it also in, in transcribing things and using the text and not just the sound, that transforms the material for them. So they experience both the, the experience of, of their words being on paper and understanding themselves as authors, as well as um, seeing connections across one another. So you'll like see, we do these workshops where we give them back the transcripts and then we, we cut the transcripts up into little excerpts and we give it to them and we have them put them up on boards. It, in relationship to big themes or something like that. And they'll meet each other and they'll be like, oh, that's mine. And the other one will be like, no, that's mine. That one's yours. Like they see each other, they see themselves in one another. So I think that um, there's something about the text that really does matter in this oral history, um, as well as the sound, which I think is for, for many people is who are outside of the project, the sound is the most powerful part. And for others, the text is the most powerful part. And that's a way to answer the last question about where they fit in that, um, in that literature. I think they deserve to be in that literature, even if they're never gonna write a book about their lives. And some of them have self-published books about their lives, those two. Um, what does it shed light? I mean, it sheds light on so many things, it's almost impossible to enumerate all of them. Um, I'll give you some of my highlights. <laughs> um, I think the first thing it sheds light on is that biomedical solutions will never be sufficient to end HIV. That could be like the top, that's like the top argument in my mind. So whether that's because, um, uh, you know, every single one of them who has children talks about why childcare or caring for their children or the foster care system or the way the state removes, sees women, right? All of it, like children matter in this. Um, uh, you see how many of them have been criminalized and the way criminalization, what the way the sort of criminal legal system has taken up the question of HIV, particularly when you look at the experiences um, of black women, but, but also of white and Latina women in the United States. And I would argue the, that 
the Black diaspora is part of that story, which is of course um, one that is, and then if we're talking about heroin use, I guess it depends on the national context, but um, criminalization laws are deeply harmful and, um, and completely counterproductive to ending HIV, AIDS. Um, so biomedical solutions are also, um, I would say the other part of biomedical solutions not being sufficient are that access to, um, to the meds is really only part of it. Like if they don't have secure housing and secure transportation and childcare, it won't work. Um, I think also how, I think they also show us, this is what I was saying before, how deeply connected the war on drugs is to HIV, um, both crack and heroin, and now um, meth and other opioids. Um, and trying to sort of, that's again also related to criminalization. Um, I would say that they also um, really do change the periodization, you know? So whether it's because you look earlier, as is the case with Marta, who you can read about in the Chicago example, or you then listen to these women who Sarah convert in 2010, you know, or 2009, and sort of understand, and in the South primarily, um, and understand how um, the South of the United States understand what that means in terms of the way the healthcare system functions. Um, and then the final thing that I would say is that, um, is that they show us that when you center people living with H, but first of all, that we all live with HIV, but they live with it inside their bodies. And so in this respect, it's not different from earlier movements that like ACT UP that have said, like we lead with the experience of people living with HIV, um, but that for them, HIV is never the only thing that they're living with inside their bodies or in their lives, right? It's just on a different ranking. And so it sort of gets to Mario's earlier question is like HIV affected white gay men in a very particular way because for many of them, they had the kinds of economic lives. I mean, also I should say, Many of them didn't. Some of the first, you know, we know from the first cases in San Francisco, for example, that almost all of those men, um, the first 24 cases, this uh, medical geographer named Michelle Cochrane has written about it when AIDS began, that all of the men, they were, once they were marked as gay, the fact that they were, all of them were living in poverty and half of them were using drugs disappeared. So it's part of how we tell the story of what HIV means and the significance of it in relationship to other things, other structural issues existing in people's lives. And the women show us that with, like they put it in very sharp relief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jenny, we have time for a few more questions. Marco. If I can, <laughs> first of all, first. No, 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 because if anyone else wants to ask something. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. It was very exciting presentation. I have two questions also because Mario stole me one. So <laughs> why is less? Uh, it's gone. Um, the first is that uh, you told, um, looking at women change uh, everything. And I get your point. The problem is methodological. Uh, how to balance the presence of the history of women living with AIDS and the history of other kinds of people, of men or gays, in the same story. So the problem is not to detach the woman's story from the others. Um, to put together is, is, my, is my methodological question. And the other is more general. Um, I wonder uh, to what extent the 
the American historiography, the American way of studying AIDS ha has affected the, the European ones. Because uh, we are studying Italy, I'm just starting studying Italy, and I am very scared from it. It's, 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 it's a different, it's exceptional history, as Mario said, but we tend to, I mean, um, follow this pattern in, in studying, uh, studying European cases. And I would like to know your opinion about that. Thank you so much again. Well, I'd like to know your opinion about that because I don't, I, it's a really, like, let's have a conversation about that. I don't, it's very hard to imagine from inside of where I am, uh, I edited, I um, peer reviewed this article about um, international responses to AIDS for this uh, big online thing. I gotta find the link, I'll send it to you, Mario, and you can send it around um, by this Japanese historian. And there was nothing about Europe now that I'm thinking about it. Was there really nothing about Europe? I gotta look. Um, this question of how different places write these histories is fascinating to me and I don't actually know how to answer it, um, which is just proving that I am a US historian living in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna hold off on answering that question. I'll, I'll answer the first question, which is, um, you know, I'll be a little snarky. Like I'm not worried that I'm not worried that there's not enough, like we need to do this and then there will need to be a weaving together. But I'm also very clear that, um, that uh, what has been written as a universal history of AIDS has actually fundamentally, in the United States has fundamentally excluded women from it and trans people from it. Um, and I think we're still in that uh, recovery phase and then the weaving will happen, um, I hope. The, the way, um, I'm not sure though, to be perfectly honest. Um, I have to decide, I mean, personally for me, like I have to decide if I wanna write another book or if I wanna keep doing this work that I'm doing because it has this other audience. I'm not quite sure. There is one book on the history of, of HIV among women. It was published by th this uh, longtime writer for the New York Times named Gina Correa, C-O-R-E-A, called The Invisible Epidemic. Um, there've been bits and pieces of it in other places, but it really hasn't been published. Um, and as I said, like the history of AIDS isn't really part of US history or historiography. Um, and obviously it doesn't sound like it is in Italian historiography either. Um, so what are the big markers for you in thinking about Italian, the Italian history of HIV AIDS? Like what are the big, what are the, just the initial touch points? And then maybe we can backtrack into it. Cause that's the thing about doing the other way to answer these questions about method and what it means to do recent history methodologically, which many of you already know, but um, you know, you have to, you have to disconnect yourself. You have to disconnect yourself from the present enough so that you can see it from different angles. And then you have to be prepared to really look at a range of contexts, I think, that initially don't seem to be about the thing that you're studying in the recent past, but are these larger contexts that then you can start to fit together. So like, I wouldn't have known, I mean, when I first started this work, I didn't think about going to the Reagan library. I thought about going to gay archives, right? Um, but it turns out that the Reagan Library has more stuff than all the gay archives put together. So what is it about the contexts that you think you see circling around AIDS in Italy? 
And I'm sure there are regional differences too. I can turn your question to my you. Italianist uh, 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 friends. Uh, but certainly, uh, as I said earlier, the way AIDS was framed, defined, has huge you know, national, regional variations uh, and differences. What's striking about doing the kind of history you, you have done and you are doing is that somehow the virus becomes itself an archive in the sense, a source. Uh, and the bodies carrying the virus somehow became the archival record, which is striking, but that poses multiple methodological, but even ethical uh, questions uh, in a way. It's a huge uh, a challenge uh, for us. I have to say I'm mesmerized by the mountain of paper behind uh, Nando, and I keep, you know, fearing I could collapse on him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> other uh, comments uh, uh, and questions? Um, it's almost 7 p.m., which was the, the time limit uh, we fixed, you know, because in, in Zoom is not healthy. Uh, to go longer, I see that Nando has turned the microphone. No, just to say that it's a fake. <laughs> it's a fake. It's an enormous fake. I thought it was, having been to your place, it did, it did look real. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I set fire on it, so okay. nothing more. There's nothing more. There's nothing more. Okay, I see. Any other question or or comment? So I think we can call this session uh, uh, to an end. Uh, please uh, join me in giving a strong, although virtual, round of applause to to uh, to Jennifer. Uh, Thanks so much. Thanks uh, so much, really. And I, I really hope it will also be the beginning of it. Yes, of dialogue, of a conversation, so. and a cooperation. And when we will finally be able to to, to try, produce something, it will be also <laughs> a chance to do some I'll very, come to visit. Yes, some very healthy academic tourism, uh, which is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and the next you session. Also, send me the the notes for the the. Zooms for the next three, the next two sessions, will, and I'll do I my will. best to come. So, speaking of which, uh, the next session will be with uh, Thibault, uh, Thibault Boulevard, uh, uh, on April. April the fifth. The fifth. Uh, no, again, uh, thanks so much, uh, and uh, thanks so much. I took a lot of notes. I have many you know, references. I will begin, you know, surfing the web and looking for them, including the last issue of Radical History uh, uh, Review, which I didn't know uh, uh, about. And um, I hope to see you all uh, at the next uh, session or even sooner at another uh, Cisco event. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Ciao, Nando. Bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ciao. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Bye. I'll do. Bye. I'll do. Bye.